it's all yours. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, welcome uh, everyone to this uh, new lockdown edition of the uh, Indonesia Study Group. Uh, it is my great pleasure today to welcome uh, Scott Merrilies, who will talk to us about uh, his new book, Faces of Indonesia, uh, 500 Postcards uh, from 1900 to 1945. Um, let me introduce Scott. Um, he has a very illustrious history. He graduated from Melbourne University in 1984 uh, with a degree in accounting and Indonesian studies, uh, probably a rather unusual a uh, combination of degrees. Within that study, he spent time uh, to learn Indonesian at Satyavachana in Salatiga, 1981 to 1982. Subsequently, in his business career, he spent 27 years uh, in Indonesia um, doing equity research, uh, working on capital markets, mining, and healthcare. Uh, but that's not why he is here today, uh, because outside of his very busy uh, business career, he started uh, yeah, probably a side career, which is um, collecting old photographs of Indonesia, old postcards, and most importantly for us today, researching their background and publishing altogether now four books uh, on these photographs and uh, postcards. So the first was Batavia in 19th century photographs published in 2000. Uh, that was followed up by greetings from Jakarta, postcards of a capital 1900 uh, to 1950. It was published in 2000. Um, and 12, and the third then was uh, Jakarta, postcards of a capital 1950 to 19. 80, which was published in 2015. And today, uh, obviously, the new one, Faces of Indonesia, that I just talked to you about. And I can uh, show it to you, actually. It's uh, with normally uh, books. They're massive achievements. But in this case, the book is really massive um, as, as well. Um, and uh, you can get the book in Australia uh, through Dymox, uh, which is uh, very convenient to us because the pre three previous books are not yet available in Australia, but Dymox is distributing uh, this new book, which you can order online for $49.95, which I think for this uh, book is a real bargain. It's done very well, high quality printings, high quality paper. Um, so I can only recommend that. I will, um, as we proceed, I will put the link um, into the chat room um, and you can uh, proceed uh, from, from there. Um, Scott also wanted to uh, let you know that to his uh, most recent um, professional commitment in Indonesia, and from 2016 to 2021, uh, this was for Podya Wija, uh, Wija Husada, which is um, a company with the largest network of diagnostic laboratories in Indonesia. They have 150 branches. And that was what led him to travel widely uh, in Indonesia from literally um, Sumatra to to Papua, and this is where his ideas about um, Indonesia's diversity uh, were shaped particularly, and that was flowing into um, this new uh, book about which we will hear uh, now from Scott. So uh, we will proceed as follows. We will hear from Scott for about uh, 45 minutes. Um, then we will open up the floor. I will say more about that later on. Um, so you can type in questions either into the chat room or in the Q&A function. Uh, but uh, obviously, before we get to that, uh, we will now hear from Scott. So again, uh, welcome, Scott, to this Indonesia study group. And uh, we look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Marcus. And thank you very much to you for the lovely introduction and also for the invitation to speak to 
ANU's Indonesia study group. Uh, it's a great honor to do that. And um, I did consider an academic career myself and didn't go in that direction. Uh, but I always enjoy speaking to people with a very serious interest in Indonesia, such as the, uh, the audience today. It's a great honor. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will now try and test my technological abilities with uh, pushing the share screen button and see if that works. Uh, so I'm bringing up the presentation and now I'm pushing share screen. Now I've got here host disabled participant share screening. Marcus, do you have to uh, enable me to share screen? Marcus, do you need to enable me to share screen? Uh, Nuke, are you there? Let me just see. Goma, can you? Yeah, 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 oh. yeah. I'm making it, sorry. Yeah, Hi. I think I already switched it. Can you I already try? Switch it. Okay, so. okay, so. Okay, okay I, I think that's, that's now worked. Um, yes, works. Very good, so I can. Let's see if I can move that up and down. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Thanks again, Marcus. Good, good afternoon, everybody, wherever you may be, or good morning if you're in, in Indonesia. Um, I'd like to uh, talk about um, uh, some conclusions and thoughts on, on diversity uh, and homogeneity in Indonesia and also the, the visual image and a little bit to do with the history of photography um, in Indonesia and, and, and the wonderful uh, uh, use that uh, early postcards uh, play in, in our ability to research uh, Indonesian history and uh, cover all those points and look forward to a discussion and, and questions after. I'm inclined to be a bit wordy sometimes, so when I've reached my limit, Marcus, don't hesitate to, to cut me off. I, I won't take offense at that. Yeah. Good. Um, the, just by way of background, um, this new book, uh, Faces of Indonesia, 500 Postcards, 1900 to 1945, aims to highlight the remarkable diversity among the people of Indonesia before independence was declared on the 17th of August, 1945, and before the concept of the nation of Indonesia was widely discussed or understood outside of uh, elite political and intellectual circles. The 500 picture postcards reveal the people of Indonesia across the entirety of the vast archipelago, quite literally from Sabang to Merauke. From when people still identified only with their own local ethnic group or clan or community, and most spoke only their local language, not the Indonesian language. It is a diversity not often witnessed today, but which provides a clear basis for understanding the choice of the national motto, Vineka Tungal Ika, or Unity in Diversity. The postcards are presented in six chapters, Sumatra, Java, Bali and Lombok, Kalimantan, Sulawesi, and Eastern Indonesia, and are complemented by essays at the beginning of each chapter that include contemporary travel accounts, observations and descriptions from books, journals, and magazines and travel guides, from the period the 1890s to the 1940s. As such, the book helps to reveal how, how the people of Indonesia were represented, both visually and in writing, during the last half century before independence. In this presentation, we will look at just three chapters because of time constraints. We look at Sumatra, Bali and Lombok, and Eastern Indonesia. My first three books focused on the history and development of the physical landscape of Jakarta from the 1850s until 1980, as revealed through early photographs, postcards, and maps. A criticism of those books has sometimes been, but where are the people? Because my books are very much focused on physical development, uh, urban development, architecture, buildings, and people obviously were not uh, prominent in those books, but obviously people play a very important role in, in cities. Um, and I've been very much aware of that criticism. Uh, I, I've been collecting photographs, 19th century, early 20th century photographs, postcards, maps, books, travel guides for, for almost 35 years. Um, I started working in Indonesia in 1989 and finished only 
that work only in April this year. I've spent 27 of the last 32 years working in Indonesia, but I've been very actively collecting. I've also been collecting early picture postcards of the people of Indonesia from, the, from prior to independence, and they'd been looking for a way to publish and, and present them. It was during my most recent position in Indonesia, as Marcus mentioned, from 2016 to 2021, as a member of the Board of Commissioners of PT Prodia with Yehusada, Indonesia's largest chain of diagnostic laboratories with more than 150 branches spread throughout all of Indonesia's provinces. But I began to think more deeply about diversity and homogeneity in Indonesia. I was very fortunate while at Prodia to be able to travel extensively in Indonesia from North Sumatra to West Papua, almost but not quite from Sabang to Merauke. And it was during my time at Prodia that this most recent book, Faces of Indonesia, 500 Postcards, 1900 to 1945, came together as an idea and as a completed work. I worked on the book during the same five year period that I was with Podia. Traveling extensively throughout Indonesia in recent years, it is clear that much of what made Indonesia diverse from a visual or aesthetic perspective has largely disappeared and is now usually only seen at weddings or at events arranged for tourists. Even to many Indonesians to whom I showed these postcards while I was preparing the book, they would often respond by saying, oh, wow, I've never seen that before. Or that is what I remember my grandmother or grandfather wearing. Even among Indonesians today, the knowledge of the diversity that is such a key element in the national motto, Vineka Tunggalika, is disappearing. This is perhaps an indication of the success of Indonesia's nation building process over the past 75 years. But it would also be an enormous pity if a knowledge of the diverse cultures and ethnicities that came together to create modern Indonesia was allowed to further fade from public consciousness. We are very fortunate that during the final half century of the colonial era, there were many outstanding photographers and also numerous prolific picture postcard publishers whose rich legacy we can continue to enjoy today. As I mentioned, we look at three chapters, Sumatra, which is chapter one, Bali and Lombok, which is chapter three, and Eastern Indonesia, which is chapter six. We can't look at all six chapters today because of time constraints, but I believe these three chapters will uh, serve us very well. From a 1920s, uh, early 1920s guidebook to Sumatra published by the official tourist bureau in, in, in Batavia, we have a quote on page three. Java is a country of magnificent realization. Sumatra has a great future. More advantageously placed than Java, this advantageous position and a more complete knowledge of its natural resources are today leading the Netherlands Indian government to develop Sumatra with tenacious energy in spite of the courage, independence, or fanaticism of populations, which render the natural organization of the country a far more difficult task than the organization of 30 millions of Javanese has been. If we go back to the early 20th century, to the early 1900s, when picture postcards uh, began to be published relating to Sumatra, uh, it was a part of Indonesia, which was a part of the, the Dutch East Indies that was really very little known. Its consciousness was largely uh, present for two reasons. Uh, one was the, uh, the economic opportunities that were opening up with, with oil and, and tobacco and rubber in the plantations in North Sumatra, just out of, out, out of, out of Medan. And also because of the, the tail end of the, what had been the 30-year uh, Aceh War, which uh, caused a, a tremendous uh, uh, loss of life in, in Aceh amongst the population of Aceh, a tremendous destabilization among the Achenese community, uh, and also, of course, loss of life and uh, great humiliation for, for the Dutch as well. Um, we'll start by um, looking at uh, some of the early postcards that were published uh, in the early 20th century uh, in, in Sumatra. Here we have here uh, Chut Putru, uh, one of the wives, I think the main wife of the, of the last Sultan, Muhammad Dawud Shah of uh, Karachi, uh, and the uh, Tuanku Ibrahim, the, the heir apparent. Uh, as many of you would know better than I, uh, uh, the Sultan was um, 
kidnapped by the Dutch in November 1902 as a way to get the uh, Sultan to, so that the, the, the children, the, the wife and child, uh, the wife and son of, uh, of, of the Sultan were, were kidnapped by the Dutch in November 1902 as a way of bringing the uh, Sultan of Aceh to, to surrender to the Dutch, which uh, indeed he did in, in, in 2003, although this didn't uh, bring uh, the uh, Achenese war necessarily to more than a, a formal end because the guerrilla war continued for, for many, many more years. But this is on the back of the fact that um, uh, the Sultan really had somewhat limited influence with, with Inachia. As a book, the 20th Century Impressions of Netherlands India, published in 1909, uh, noted, uh, the heart of the kingdom, which we are accustomed to call Throat Aceh or Great Aceh, was then under the administration of the Sultan who was in actual fact not much more than a court king, who always strove for supremacy over other parts of the kingdom, but whose influence was often of no great importance there. The Sultan of Aceh possessed little territory. It was owned, his influence on territorial chiefs was, was slight. So uh, his surrender in 1903, as I said, didn't necessarily lead to the end of hostilities in Aceh. The, Power was often mentioned uh, in, in held in the hands of some of the regional leaders who were called the Ulebalang. And we see such one Ulebalang uh, on the left here, Tutu Raja Hetam or Hitam. And again, the same book in 1909, uh, it's quoted uh, at the disposal of the Ulebalangs for the maintenance, for the maintenance of their authority, are their blood relatives, their followers in brackets, who receive housing, food, and clothing for themselves and their families from the Ulevela, and those who have become his, with those who have become his owing to debt and are therefore bondsmen, the Pang Lima Prang, military commander, who has distinguished himself as a warrior, and when he is required to do battle with his Ulevela, receive the loan of weapons from the latter. So the, these uh, uh, Ulevela, the Pukus, uh, were often uh, very, very influential uh, in, in the Aceh War. And the Aceh War was very, very prominent in the minds of uh, the people of the early uh, 20th century. And hence, uh, Aceh does figure quite prominently in, um, in, in, in early postcards of Aceh. Of course, the Achenese fighters were, were very, very skillful guerrilla fighters. Uh, the Aceh War went for 30 years. It wasn't, the Dutch thought it would be a bit of a walkover, but it turned out to be anything but that. And it became very evident that, um, that the, the Archimedes were great fighters. But in a book published in 1923 by uh, Frank Gardner, an American uh, travel writer, uh, he, he wrote, and I quote, in Aceh, every man is a born soldier and every village has its army ready for service in times of war. The people have been fighting foreigners there for hundreds of years. The same 20th century impressions of Netherlands India, published in 1909, added to this feeling when they said, when the Aceh man goes out, he wears a sharp pointed dagger on one side. Furthermore, when traveling, he carries the Aceh sword, whilst the Clerwan, carried without a sheath, serves more as an ornamental weapon the followers of chiefs are always taken in campaign. The uplanders also take with them when traveling two throwing spears and one ordinary spear with or without a gun. So clearly the, uh, the impression was that uh, uh, the Archimedes soldier was very much uh, ready for war and very capable if, uh, if war was required. Um, we see here some very interesting and probably quite well-known photographs uh, taken by um, a Dutch photographer who spent 30 years. In fact, he was one of two European photographers, uh, Christian Benjamin uh, Neuenhaus, uh, from the late 1880s until the early 1920s. He, he ran a photo, had a photographic studio in, in three parts of Sumatra, different times, Padang, Medan, and Banda Aceh. And um, this series of four studio photographs were published by him as, as postcards between 1905 and 1910. And um, these are beautifully composed and um, uh, reveal quite a lot about the, the, the hairstyles, the, 
the jewelry, the clothing, uh, the social customs of the Achenese at the beginning of the 20th century. It's also been commented by many people that the, the, the ladies in these photographs are not wearing jilbabs, even though they're Achenese. Uh, that's something which has even in recent years been receiving attention that um, uh, photographs of Archinese women from uh, the colonial era uh, show that they're often not wearing jilbabs. And that's something which uh, uh, has been interpreted in different ways, but obviously uh, the ladies at the time obviously wore what they thought was appropriate, and whether what they wore at the time was politically correct for the 21st century is, is something that um, different people need to dwell on and reach their own conclusions but obviously you know, they wore what uh, they thought was appropriate for them. Uh, the lady on the far left was often thought to be Chutmutia and in fact in 1969 the Indonesian post office published a stamp with exactly this photograph just the face just the head uh, was cropped from this photograph and published as a stamp representing Chutmutia uh, in, in 1969, um, although it's now now felt this lady is probably not Chutmutia. And when you think about it, um, uh, Neuenhaus's studio was in Banda Aceh. Uh, the guerrilla warfare was still raging in 19, between 1905 and 1910. Chutmutia herself died in 1910. Um, uh, but she was obviously a very famous part of the guerrilla campaign against the Dutch. So it's, it's probably a little bit hard to believe that she would put on her, her best clothes and go into a, a Dutch-owned uh, photographic studio in Banda Aceh um, uh, while the guerrilla warfare with, uh, with the Dutch was still raging. But um, the, these are beautiful uh, studio photographs and, and whether or not it's uh, Chukmutia on the, on the left, probably it's not. They're still lovely, lovely photographs. Um, these are studio photographs. Um, we have another series of four Archinese uh, photographs by an unknown photographer, not taken in the studio, but again, very high quality photographs. The photographers clearly composed them uh, very, very carefully. We only have descriptions of group of Archinese men, group of Archinese boys, Puku uh, Me of Masara. I was never able to find out where Masara is located, and an Archinese man and his attendant in feast costume. So we can contrast here where we have the composition within, within studio, with a studio, uh, a European photographic studio. And here, uh, a talented photographer with careful composition is working outside the studio and, and producing very, very memorable works, which are, which are beautifully composed. From Aceh, we move to uh, North Sumatra. And um, North Sumatra uh, became uh, very prominent in uh, the minds of, of travelers and, and guidebook writers and, uh, and the general public um, in the early 1900s as well. And this, again, uh, had a lot to do with uh, the economic interests that were developing at the time, as I mentioned before, around rubber, oil, and, and uh, tobacco and others as well. Um, but on, on this topic of diversity, uh, there, there, there was a, a lot of attention focused on the fact that even amongst the Bataks themselves, there was uh, a high level of diversity. The National Geographic magazine in February 1930 noted, there are several tribes of Bataks in the regions surrounding Toba, and the customs and dress vary according to the tribe. Some of the Bataks have been converted to Christianity. Others have become nominally Mohammedans or Muslims. Yet a majority of them still cling to their ancient religious beliefs and animistic practices. From this, the book we used earlier, 20th Century Impressions of Netherlands India, this great diversity amongst the Bataks is also highlighted. And I quote, among the Bataks, three chief groups or main tribes are distinguished, namely the Tobas, the Mandailingas, and Dairias which distinction is chiefly based on the difference of the dialects spoken by each of these principal groups. In addition to the three groups named, there are other groups of peoples among the Bataks, namely the Timor Bataks who live northeast of the Toba Lake, and the southeast of these, the Raja Bataks, who are regarded as a subdivision of the Timor Bataks. In part of the inner tracks to the west of the Lake Toba live the Pakpak Bataks, and on the high ground to the north of the lake, the Karo Bataks. And the, 
postcard publishers didn't often distinguish uh, between these various different types of assets, but these four uh, postcards published in the 1920s uh, are focusing very much uh, on the Cairo bucket. So the photographer and or the uh, postcard publisher is sufficiently sensitive to these differences to want to highlight that these, in fact, are representations of people from uh, the Cairo bucket group. It was also of interest to Europeans um, that cannibalism had used to exist in the previously existed in the Batak areas, but was largely now thankfully a thing of the past. The, the postcard at the top um, there is a Nevrogra cannibal, a former cannibal. Interesting that he's described as, as a former cannibal. Uh, National Geographic in February 1930 touched upon this issue, 1930, by saying, and I quote, Today, thanks to the efforts of the Dutch government and the missionaries, the trip to Toba Lake and its surrounding territory can be made in perfect safety. In the last 50 years, the Bataks have undergone a great change. They are no longer hostile to the white man, and they have long since ceased the practice of the ceremonial eating, a fine distinction from cannibalism, of their elderly relatives and their enemies. They are now a peaceful agriculture and pastoral people. The dress of the ladies uh, and the jewelry of the ladies uh, also uh, focused, uh, featured very extensively in people's observations. I rather like this series of four postcards because we, we can look at a young girl on, on the left and then follow the passage of the years through to uh, an elderly lady on the right. Of course, each, each, these are four different ladies, but it's interesting to look at four different age groups. It's very much like the passage of time we are witnessing. And the, 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 the earrings that Batak women uh, often used to wear, as we can see particularly in the two ladies on the right-hand side, attracted a lot of attention. Um, the great Dutch uh, novelist, Louis Cooperus, in his wonderful book, Eastwood, published in 1924, wrote, and I quote, they also wear most peculiar massive silver ear ornaments, like a double silver coil or two question marks forged together. One is under the cloth where it drags and tortures the ear. The other stands up against the head cloth and is attached to a flap of it. White and pale green shoots of the Penang palm are stuck like little pearl tassels among the cushion-like curved headdress. We could see how one of these girls suffered under this heavy ear decoration which he took off with difficulty and which weighed over two pounds in our hand. Um, moving into Batak villages, again, very much a fascination with uh, Batak housing. But I tended to avoid for, uh, housing per se in, in my book as, as, it, as the focus is on the people. But uh, here we have some beautifully composed photographs. Again, great care has been um, uh, put into uh, the composition of these photographs and they've been published by three different uh, postcard publishers that we've got Ernst from uh, Langkat, Kleingrote in Medan and, and Meister and Barakant in, in Medan. So clearly three different postcard publishers were fascinated by this type of scene, traditional Batak dress and jewellery uh, in front of their traditional uh, housing. Um, the two on the left are, are from 1910s and the, and the two on the right are from 1920s. Also, um, variety and diversity uh, in, in North Sumatra through the, um, the work on the plantations. Uh, there was not enough labor uh, amongst the local populations. It had to be imported, and uh, that normally came from Java, from China, and, and from India. Uh, here we see four representations of, of the Chinese in North Sumatra. And, the National Geographic in January 1920 noted that the work of the plantation is many sided and the various nationalities employed are usually engaged in their own distinctive branches of labor. Thus, or those replaced by other races, or thus, although sometimes replaced by other races, Chinese predominate on the actual work of the tobacco plants. And then the same article goes on to talk about the Indians, the Klings, the the Bengalis, the bullock cart drivers are cleans, camels, the carpenters are boyans from west of Medan, 
the Javanese are woodmen, road builders and gardeners, and the Bataks and Sumatra Malays, who are not obtainable in large numbers, nor reliable for sustained labor, clear the land for territory to planting and build roads and sheds. The ubiquitous Sikh is often found in his favorite capacity of guard or, or policeman. So here we have four beautiful picture postcards, all photographed by Kleingurter, a German um, photographer who was like Neuenhaus, um, active in Sumatra for around 30 years, although Kleingurter uh, focused uh, mainly on, on the work in on his photography in Meda. Um, he published um, four sets of five, 25 postcards in 1911, a total of 100 postcards in 1911 and republished them in 1913, um, focusing on, on the people and, and life, uh, livelihoods and customs of the people of North Sumatra. An extremely talented photographer. These are all studio compositions, but they are, they are beautifully composed and a lot of thought has gone into uh, the composition and the color of the colors and the quality of the printing. Moving on to um, West Sumatra, again highlighting what people found was amazing diversity, even uh, on the island of Sumatra itself before we even leave Sumatra. Um, we have uh, the Maninkabau of, of, uh, of the Padang Bukitinggi area of West Sumatra. And um, what, of course, amazed uh, people there was the what they call the matriarchate or the matrilineal aspects of society, and uh, hence the uh, focus on on the ladies of, of, of West Sumatra. And uh, uh, a quote from the 19, early 1920s guide to Sumatra mentions this remarkable institution existed only with some tribes in the world, and is found nowhere preserved in such a pure form as it is in the case here with the tribe of the Minangkabau where the right of relationship is exclusively maternal. With people who adhere to the matriarchy, blood relation is only considered to exist through women who are mutually related or among those who descend from the same woman. The children always follow the maternal relation. The father of the children remains altogether outside of this connection. All children from one mother are considered fully related as brothers and sisters even in the case they have not the same father. Now this quote may not be accurate. I'm sure there are some people on this uh, webinar today who have a very deep knowledge of this, but this is how it was perceived in the, in the early 1920s. We then go to the island of Nias. Um, and uh, of course, again, moving to a very, very different society, a very warrior-like uh, society. Um, you know, the National Geographic uh, is a lady explorer um, who visited Nias uh, for August uh, in August 1931. Her article was published in August 1931, and uh, again a fascinating uh, a culture she was able to witness uh, on, on Nias. And she wrote, the, "The coats of mail are, sh are of sheet metal, which takes the place of rhinoceros hide formerly used." Under Dutch rule, warfare has been reduced to a minimum. But until recently, each chief kept his fighting force in readiness. Actual battle consisted of fencing with spear and warding with shield, or at close range, using the knife instead of the spear. While great acclaim attended the victor in open battle, he might gain almost equal attention by securing a head from a hostile village, even though it might have been taken from ambush and the victim, a woman or child. Um, so we, we have here uh, two photographs by, by Neuenhaus, who we saw earlier on with those lovely four photographs of, uh, of, of Aceh uh, from 1905 to 1910. We know Neuenhaus visited uh, Nias in 1918. And the, uh, the photograph on the top left-hand corner and also the left-hand side of the vertical photograph showing the Nias warrior were both uh, taken by, by Neuenhaus. So we can also see here uh, another one of Neuenhaus's uh, photographs, the Nias woman, the second from the right. Again, uh, stunning. Look at the earrings there and, and, and the headgear uh, that she is wearing. And also look at the, uh, the, 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 the other representation of some ladies on, on the far right there, 
uh, Aeneas feast of the, the headgear and, and, and the, the clothing and the ornamentation of those particular ladies. Moving on from Sumatra, we, we, we now move on to the valley. And um, this is a quote from a guidebook published in 1932 by a man called uh, Bontaba, or um, And I quote, Bali is a fairyland of wonderful charm. The harmonious combination of glorious natural beauty, temple architecture, old and new, and the colorful life of the natives has a fascination for everyone. Naturally, therefore, the island has in recent years become the resort of tourists. They come from, a far, from far and near to make the acquaintance of a handsome and blithesome people, innocent of the struggle for existence, which has destroyed so much of the beautiful in the life of the Westerner. I want to start with these postcards of Bali, not because they're necessarily riveting in themselves, but because they're very actually early for Bali, even though they're only from 1911, 1912. Everywhere else in Indonesia, or the, uh, the Netherlands Indies, we, we can find postcards from 1899 or 1900 or 1901, 1902. But they're very hard to find that early in, in Bali, because obviously uh, Bali was to some extent closed um, for, for Westerners um, uh, uh, and until really the Dutch had consolidated their control of Bali through the, the shocking two Puputans of 1906 and 1908, which of course was horrific um, uh, loss of life, but also were reported uh, as being uh, a, a real stain on, on, on Dutch uh, credibility, the Dutch reputation to allow such a thing to happen. Uh, and then there were in fact very, very few photographers in, 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 in Bali, um, prior to uh, 1910. Uh, of course, they, they were, were a few, but really very, very few. If you look at the, the books that have been published about photography in Bali, they, they tend to start with Gregor Krauss in 1912, although of course he's at Oben Ginsburg and was there in the 1860s. So, um, so when, when, when the, the Dutch decided to launch tourism uh, in, in, in Bali, which I think is normally felt to be around about 1914, um, uh, they, they, they had the opportunity to, to portray Bali to some, to some extent of a different way to which uh, the rest of, of their colony was being portrayed or indeed managed. So in, in Bali, you, you don't see, you, you see a very different type of postcard to what you, you often see throughout the rest of Indonesia. For example, uh, there are no missionary schools, no churches. There's no industry, there is no factories because foreigners were not allowed to, or the Dutch were not allowed to buy or lease uh, land to build uh, plantations. They weren't allowed to build factories. Christian missionaries were kept out. Uh, Bali was going to be preserved as, as, uh, as a pure Balinese culture and then opened up, up to tourists. So uh, Bali is the only part of uh, the book where most of the postcards are in fact after 1920 and all other uh, the five chapters of the book, most of the postcards are before 1920, but in Bali they're predominantly after 1920. And these particular images here, we don't know who the uh, photographer was, but they were published, we know, in 1911 and 1912. They're, they're very, very early representations of, of Bali. Um, obviously, Balinese royalty was still uh, a topic high in people's minds, and um, even after 1908, the Putan of 1908. Um, they were in the 19th century, I believe there were nine kingdoms. I think, uh, I think one of them was at Nengwe, disappeared. They became eight, I think, after 1908. Um, and we see here uh, the uh, representations of, of some of the royalty uh, of Bali. Now, interestingly, the, the, the postcard on the top left hand corner is from a photograph taken in the 1860s. Uh, Buleleng in North Bali was the first part of Bali to come under Dutch control. and. Uh, uh, Gusti Kutjelanti uh, uh, visited Bali with his, sorry, visited Batavia uh, in uh, the 1860s, and he was photographed by Woodbury and Page uh, in Batavia. Uh, this postcard wasn't actually published until 1910, uh, almost half a century after the photograph was taken, but uh, uh, very, very early representation of, uh, of Balinese uh, royalty, at least that 
portion of which, which in the mid 1860s was already under Dutch control, which at that time was still uh, mainly in the north. Um, we also see the nobility below the royalty featured prominently in, uh, in, in postcards, early postcards of Bali, because of consciousness of the, the caste system. The second postcard from the, the left is mistakenly called Java Man Singapore. You couldn't be further from the truth, but postcard publishers often made mistakes. This is a, a beautiful, beautifully uh, composed photograph of the two uh, high caste. Uh, Balinese, a high caste Balinese couple. Interestingly, too, um, this was a photograph taken by the most famous European female photographer in, in the colonial era, Tilly Wiesenborn, uh, who mainly was based in Garut in West Java, but she visited Bali in the early 1920s and uh, left behind some beautiful photographs, um, one of which uh, is this one here, incorrectly shown as, uh, as Java man in, in Singapore. Um, in, in, in Bali, observations were frequently made also about religion and about art, which I think is very much what the Dutch wanted, because clearly um, uh, the, the intertwining between art and religion was seen as very much part of the, uh, the pure Balinese culture, which, which the Dutch uh, wished to maintain. And in, in a, a book published, uh, I think a booklet called Bali, a Garden of Eden, published in 1938. Uh, it was mentioned, everything in Bali testifies to its religion and its art. This is not a mere civilization, but a truly cultural expression on the part of this island, which thrills us with its beauty, unassailable, more especially as regards to the spiritual life of its inhabitants. For this happy people, life on earth seems to be one uninterrupted festival an ecstasy of overwhelming and overflowing joy, a gratitude and reverence for the gods that are the creators of all life and, and who maintain it. We also see um, more representations uh, of, of religion in Bali through the uh, processions to the temple. And there's a lovely quote in that uh, uh, book Eastward by the great uh, Dutch novelist Louis Kupelis, it's a bit long, but it's, uh, it, it is beautiful, and I will read it, so you bear with me. Um, and I quote, After seeing the ceremony once at twilight in a small temple in the mud, we saw it unexpectedly again in a very rich temple amidst a blaze of sunshine. And the contrast was one of great beauty. It was also a great cleanliness, for on these occasions the temple courts have to be purified of all dirt, and the unclean dogs are banished. Along the road went the women with swaying footsteps, their kinds trailing the transparent salendang about proud bosoms. And on their heads, they carried the gracefully arranged sacrificial basket with fruit and flowers. They mounted the high carved steps. There were no men, only a few young boys and girls were present. Flowers were wound in their hair, in their head clothes and at their ears. And the gold interwoven printed linen and silk glittered and shone. The women were triumphant. They are never more beautiful than at this moment of piety. They are never so dignified as when they place their baskets in front of the invisible gods on the long sacrificial tables. Only one man, the priest, went among them. Um, Scott, can I just uh, briefly interrupt you? There's sure. some people who uh, suggest you might want to push the full view button. Um, oh, of course. I, I think okay. actually we, you know, it's, it's visible, it's good, but um, I think you could make it even larger by um, going to okay. the full view. Function. Okay, um, I think to do that, I may need to go out of the PDF and into the PowerPoint version, possibly. Yeah, right? so that, that seems to be the issue. I mean, it, it's fine if you want to continue the way it is. I think you it's- know, if, you, if, you, if you've got requests to do that, I'm very happy to try and yeah. mm. comply. Um, let's see. So if I now go into the PowerPoint version, and I can probably do that. Is that better? Uh, you have to go back to the share screen. Okay, so 
Is that better? Well, yes. Yes. Good, 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 good. Okay, Doug. So now I can go back to where I was. So no, I'm sorry, I didn't do that earlier. Yeah. That's fine. Uh, it was it was well visible, but uh, this is better. Good. How many more minutes do I have left, Margaret? Well, uh, probably about ten. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Thank you. So, of course, uh, great attention was also focused on um, the uh, arts of um, uh, of Bali. And dancing, of course, uh, very prominent, um, very popular with, with the tourists then, just as indeed it is now. Um, from a book of the same guidebook by Faber, Bali, A Land of a Thousand Temples, published in 1932, um, we here, uh, we can see Faber uh, writing, passing now to the dancers of Bali. Let me say at once that everyone who sees them, be he possessed of an artistic sense or not, is impressed and fascinated. It is a spectacle of bewitching beauty, although the European is far from qualified to appreciate it to the full. The spectacle of a wonderful coordination of rapid movements, quickly succeeding each other. The play of the muscles of almost the whole body in perfect harmony and beauty of rhythm. The dances are most impressive when performed in temple or palace court or proper settings. Again, some lovely uh, photographs of, of Balinese dances. Uh, the, mainly the legon and uh, the, as we saw before, the, the janga. Uh, the janga, I believe, was actually um, developed only in the late 1920s. Um, I have a postcard of the janga dance from 1928. I've not been able to find any reference earlier than that to the jungle. And I think even in uh, Walter Spies and Beryl de Zoot's book, they, re they refer to the jungle as being a, a relatively new dance. I've, I've never been able to find out if that was developed in tourists or whether it emerged um, locally. Um, uh, these uh, postcards were largely published by a Japanese publisher, Sagami. Um, he may not have been the photographer, but um, uh, they are certainly very uh, beautiful images. Um, given time constraints, I won't go through all of the quotes now, but there was a great fascination uh, for, for the male dancing uh, as well. And uh, here we have the Kebiar Duduk, uh, which uh, again, uh, Spies uh, and uh, Dazut uh, focused on uh, in their book, Dance and Drama in Bali, published in, in 1938. Um, these photographs are interesting. These are actually taken in Paris. The, colonial ex the Paris Colonial Exposition uh, in 1931 was the first time Balinese dancers performed outside of, uh, of, of the Indies. Uh, it was a spectacular success, um, spectacular success. Each of the performances was, was tickets were sold out and there were rave reviews in Europe. Um, you have to remember, uh, uh, the depression was getting underway globally. Um, World War I and the terror and horrors of World War I were still very clear in people's minds. And, uh, and here you have these spectacular, spectacularly dressed dancers um, coming to, to Europe for the, the, the exposition and the, uh, all the, the get with the gamelan music uh, and the, the evocative dancing. It was spectacularly successful. These are the first actual color photographs I've been able to find that were produced as postcards. Uh, in, in, in Indonesia. Now, these are actual real color photographs. Um, color photography really only got, under, got underway in the 1910s. Co uh, color postcards from before 1931 tend to be colored by hand before they're printed, whereas these are actual color photographs from, from 1931. Um, the work of, uh, of women and men uh, is a, a fascination uh, with uh, photographers and postcard publishers. Uh, throughout Indonesia. Uh, different parts of Indonesia uh, gave different roles to we uh, women and men in terms of uh, work. And um, the most interesting one probably is on the far right there, the, the lady house painter. Um, not something one would see uh, in, in many parts of the world. Um, Louise Koch in her wonderful book, Our Hotel in Bali, uh, referred to uh, the fact that um, 
house painting was seen to be uh, unmanly, therefore it was the women who performed this role. And there's a lovely image uh, on, on, on the right of uh, exactly that happening. Um, the role of men we see uh, on the top left-hand corner, Balinese warriors, of course, if you go back to the 1910s, 1920s, the image of a Balinese warrior was still very fresh in people's minds. There were seven military campaigns by the Dutch against the Balinese between the 1840s and 1908. Um, the Balinese also turned out to be very, very skillful uh, guerrilla warriors. Um, and so uh, we don't often think of Balinese men today as being warriors, but clearly in 1914, when this postcard was published, the concept of a, uh, a Balinese male as a warrior is, is still obviously clear in, in, in people's minds. Just briefly uh, looking at um, Eastern Indonesia, uh, given time constraints, um, I, I divided Eastern Indonesia into, into four modern provinces, East Nusa Tenggara, uh, the Malaccas, the North Malaccas and, and Papua. And we'll look uh, quickly through, through these. Um, the, uh, starting with um, East Nusa Tenggara, Flores, uh, Really, in, in Eastern Indonesia, the missionaries, both the Protestants and the Catholics, uh, were, were very successful uh, in, in, in a way which they were not in uh, all parts of Indonesia. These two postcards from 1930s, both published by a, by a Catholic mission. One of them on the left, the, 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 the message is, um, uh, now a child of God, uh, and the two girls on the, on the right, uh, newly baptized. So, these postcards are often published to highlight the work of these missions in, in the Indies and also to raise money back in, in Europe to be sent to continue the work of the missions. Um, these are four stunning um, photographs. Again, Floris published as postcards circa 1940. Uh, I don't know who the photographer was. We look at the, the mother and child, uh, second from the left, she's staring intently in front of her, away from the camera, the child was staring intently at the photographer. The three girls with the extraordinary hair, um, to me an utterly stunning postcard. Uh, I considered that the front cover of the book, actually. Um, stunning, stunning photograph. Um, another aspect uh, of uh, Eastern Indonesia, which we can also see uh, in, in, in Sumatra and, and in Kalimantan and in Sulawesi, was the large number of what you might call kings or rajas or chieftains. Uh, there, there wasn't a lot of, um, it wasn't like Sulawesi had one king or, or Kalimantan had one king. Kingdoms were often extremely small, uh, all, all the better for the Dutch to be able to um, manipulate them and conquer them. But here we have in Flores a postcard showing five kings. Um, um, in this particular, uh, postcard bottom um, right hand corner, we see another king, in this case in, 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 in Timor. Um, above that is, is a postcard from an expedition actually taken place in 1909, not 1912, by a, by a German um, geologist, uh, Johannes Wanner, who worked for Shell, but also did his own research uh, as he traveled through Eastern Indonesia. Uh, and again, some very, very remarkable uh, images in, in places that were rarely visited and, and, and rarely photographed. Uh, Alor, of course, again, um, a place which is rarely visited today by, by tourists, uh, or by both Indonesian and foreign, let alone back in those days. Uh, so again, the, the head hunting, the, the military aspects of, of, of their culture uh, represented and in this case, quite early postcards, 1905, we're already getting uh, postcards showing, uh, uh, I think Koppenschneller means headhunters, so uh, in Dutch. And um, so again, the representations of the headhunters would have been something which would have been very, very interesting for the publisher Van Dorp, who's, uh, whose shop, shop was located in Batavia. As we move into the Malaccas, Ambon, again, um, the, uh, the success of the missionaries is very evident, um, going back to really the 17th century. And some rather remarkable and then very carefully composed uh, photographs 
by an unknown photographer, which had been uh, produced as uh, as postcards. Uh, the the image um, on the far right, uh, which is the three ladies preparing for the church, um, almost as shades of uh, the, the great Dutch artist Van Dyck. Um, three ladies, uh, one of them in the center staring at us, the one on the right we see in profile. Um, and um, really some very, very interesting representations uh, of, of the clothing and customs in, in Ambon. Um, the shipping line KPM uh, in 1903 uh, wrote about the, the dress of some of the Ambonese, which was really rather Western, as you can see uh, on, 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 the, on, the, on the left. And they, they quote in this guidebook from 1903, the KPM guide to Netherlands, India. And I quote, in their dress, the Ambonese burghers keep the medium between Europeans and natives. And when they go to church on Sundays, the men are dressed in black cloth coats and trousers. The women on the contrary wear a long wide dress of a black shiny material, whilst from the left armband a white handkerchief hangs down. This dress, gloomy and without taste, is evidently the result of the strict ideas of the teachers of the, of the gospel. Um, Scott, um, we yep. need to come to the end pretty soon. Okay. So can we probably yep. have one example from Papua? Uh, yes. In uh, sure. the conclusion. Very much so. Uh, in Papua, I've got uh, just two slides, I think, uh, Marcus. I'm very happy to show you both, and I won't read the commentary. But uh, um, clearly, Papua was regarded as being um, uh, extremely primitive. And um, uh, uh, yes, and I will represent it as such. And um, uh, very, very little understood at all. Only, only rare visits to coastal communities in, in Papua, but produced really some uh, remarkable uh, images um, from the 1900s through to the 1930s. And these last two postcards um, are postcards 499 and 500, and very much show Marauke. I want the postcard four shows Sabang, and postcard 500 shows uh, Marauke. But this is very much. Uh, 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 some postcards from the Dutch parts of, uh, of New Guinea at that time. But uh, thank you very much. And I'm um, sorry if I, I went over time. But thank you for your patience. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you very much, uh, Scott, for this uh, wonderful uh, presentation. So if you could just stop the share screen that we can uh, return to the uh, normal uh, function of, of Zoom. All right, so now we are opening the floor for Q&A, and uh, we will um, have several ways for you to um, ask a question. So you can just raise your hand um, um, if you would prefer that and ask your question live. You could also um, type your question into the Q&A function, and then I would either call on you to ask the question when... Uh, the question um, is up in the queue, um, or if you prefer, I could read out your question um, as well. So the first question comes from Richard Matthews. Um, Richard, if you would like to ask your question um, live, uh, please go ahead and do so. Yes, thanks, Marcus, and hello, Scott. It's great to see hello, you. Richard. And, nice uh, to see you too. Thanks for joining. Yeah, and uh, it's a it's a great book, as uh, you know said before and I loved your presentation um, and it's a it's a wonderful documentation of all the postcards and um, you know the the work of photographers in um, early uh, well in, in Indonesia prior to the prior to independence and I'd wondered if uh, during your travels you've ever come across photographs by early indigenous or Indonesian photographers because um, their view would no doubt, or possibly anyway, would be diff would provide a different perspective on Indonesian life to that of Dutch or Western photographers. And in my mind, I'm thinking of um, photographers who might have been um, working for um, royal families, for example, or um, for um, uh, indigenous companies, local Indonesian companies, and so forth. And I wondered if you've come across any 
any such works by indigenous photographers. Indeed, if there were any um, uh, at the early stages of the 20th century. Thanks. Thanks, Richard. Yes, there's, there's one exceptional example. Um, his work appears in the Java chapter, which I, I didn't cover today. Um, uh, Cassian Cephas, um, I think he lived 1845 to 1912, approximately. Uh, he was the court photographer to Sultan the Monk of Buono the Seventh, um, and uh, he took some marvelous photographs uh, uh, of the court, and uh, he's he's regarded as being the first important um, Indonesian photographer, uh, and um, extremely uh, sensitive. Some of his uh, really really beautiful. Uh, Photographs. I'm, I'm not sure if I can um, share screen with you, uh, but um, I've got the whole book here. Uh, uh, looking through Java, uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to be allowed to. Do you want me to share screen to answer this, Marcus? Or uh, if you could do it quickly, yes. If if you have to look, uh, you know. For a long time, then probably. No, no, I've um, okay, good. I've got uh, okay, so so Cassie and Cephas, for example, you see postcard 97, top uh, left hand corner there. Um, if we go on to uh, some of the uh, like again, Cassie and Cephas, you can see uh, the, 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 the Chris maker, the young man uh, on second from the right, um, and also the Wayankul puppet maker, uh, second, sorry, so, so second, the young man second from the left and the Wayankul maker uh, second from the right. Possibly the Chris makers on the far left is also his. Um, there are numerous others, um, perhaps most famously, uh, the images of Japanese women. These are all Cassie and Cephas, uh, beautifully hand colored by the publisher, but these are, these are his photographs. Uh, and as are these, except the one on the far left, which is believed to be from his, his uh, son. Uh, the Lady being massaged, top right hand corner is Cassian Cephas. Um, and the, uh, the card players, uh, top left hand corner, and the opium smokers, top right hand corner, are also Cassian Cephas. He's certainly the best known uh, example. All right, thanks very much. The next uh, question comes from uh, Robert Cripp. Thanks very much, Scott. That was a really fascinating uh, presentation. I wonder if you can tell us anything about the way in which postcards were used. So uh, who bought them and what did they do with them? Did they always send them and who did they send them to? Uh, or did people use them as a kind of substitute for taking their own photographs? Uh, mm -hmm. Did they only take them, did they only buy photographs uh, postcards when they were traveling as tourists or did they buy them in other circumstances? So we have an mm. image of how postcards were used in the late 20th century. Mm. Was thank it you different very, you. in the thank earlier you. period? Very much so, Robert. Thank you very much for your question. And uh, yes, yes, postcards really, the golden era of postcards was from the 1890s until the late 1910s. It was about, it was about 20, 25 years. And the uh, Billions of them were sent around the world. The post offices internationally made them very cheap to send, and um, technology made printing images uh, on uh, printing photographs became only really possible in, in, an, economic, in an economical way in the in the eighteen nineties. And and postcards in this era, uh, I think, are very different to the postcards which I grew up. I'm up with. I'm fifty nine. I grew up in sixties and seventies with picture postcards from like beachside towns and um, you'd send a postcard to your grandmother or something and it might be a palm tree or a beach or something. Um, postcards had a far, far wider function in the first couple of decades of the 20th century. Um, they, they, ena they, they enabled uh, 
the receiver of the postcard who was quite often outside of Indonesia, in, quite often in, in, in Europe, but not always, maybe the United States or uh, maybe somewhere else, it might even be Australia. But uh, certainly many were sent to Europe. It became a way for the recipient to, to, uh, to, to see more about the, the colony. Um, um, photography uh, was still quite expensive uh, up until the end of the 19th century. Uh, printing photographs didn't really become possible until the 1890s, but with postcards, you could print a photograph. Uh, you could, and then uh, quite cheaply, and then that postcard could be bought quite cheaply, um, and it could be posted to a, a friend maybe in Indonesia, or it could be posted to a friend or a family member anywhere in the world, or, uh, as per the other point you made, Robert, you, you could buy it as, as a substitute for not taking a photograph yourself. Now, in, in my second book, uh, Greetings from Jakarta, Postcards of the Capital, 1900 to 1950, you can see how widely postcards were actually used because the images on postcards are quite extraordinary. Now, in a way which you would never have seen when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s. Uh, you might find, for example, um, uh, infrastructure like gas works or, or, or a water reservoir or a telephone exchange. Um, um, or, or you find government buildings or, or commercial buildings. Uh, um, the signs of progress, like tramways, railway stations, uh, um, uh, almost as if some people were buying those to show to their to their friends or family back in Europe, that, hey, that we are progressing as well. We may be um, a colony away from the motherland, but um, but we have modern technology here as well. We have a guessworks. We have um, we have a telephone exchange. Um, uh, we, we have a hospital, we have schools, all, all of these things were appearing in postcards. And so it became apparent to me when, when I was preparing my second book that there were so many thousands of postcards published that in fact you could, you could, you could build a, a, you could completely recreate the city of Chicago um, physically, uh, uh, the physical landscape through picture postcards. Um, and uh, because so many aspects uh, were, were appeared on picture postcards, uh, that you had really a wonderful insight in, 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 into 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 um, into Jakarta through postcard, and the same same with the people. Um, in, in, in in my most recent book, uh, this one we're talking about today, um, the obviously the images in many of these postcards would have been exotic to the recipient. Um, you can imagine in, in 1932, 1933, 1935, being in Bali and sending postcards of a Balinese dancer, for example, back to um, depression plague Europe or depression plague the United States. No wonder people in Europe and the US got so excited by Bali in the 1920s, 1930s. Um, so they, they, they served a very important purpose in, a, in, a, in an era when, when photography was, was expensive, photographs were expensive, um, books often didn't contain photographs until the early, very early 1900s. Um, so they, 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 they were like the, they, their, their window was the 1890s to let's say 1920, when the best way to send an image to someone and send it cheaply and cost efficiently and quickly was to send a postcard. Thank you, Scott. The next question is from Campbell McKnight. Can I, uh, sorry. Um, can I just follow up what you said before about the exotic nature of the uh, subjects of the postcards? I was uh, struck, or I was thinking about all the other, many other books of photographs uh, that we've had from Indonesia, uh, not just from postcards, which you've done so well. Uh, but what's, what's going on here with this interest in the exotic, particularly in the selection in this most recent book of yours. Um, it's a sort of, it's related to the ethnographic interest in the Indies also. Uh, I think it's, can you talk a bit more about, explore this a little bit more rather than just, oh, here's a pretty picture. What's actually going on? Yeah, I, th I think this does, I think you can, but I, the question, I, I think it does tie in with this theme of diversity uh, because um, the, 
there was so much of a revelation, I think, to visitors who were traveling around different parts um, of the Indies and, and, and seeing so much that was different. Um, uh, European involvement in, in Indonesia for so long focused very extensively in, in Java. Of course, very early on, it was, was the Spice Islands, but, but the focus was very much on, on Java. And it was really only in the, in the second half of the 19th century um, that exploration really began in uh, many other parts of Indonesia, be it in Sumatra, for example, like photographs from before the 1870s almost don't exist. Um, Van Kinsbergen took the first photographs in Bali when he accompanied the Governor General there in 1865. Um, Sulawesi and, 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 and Kalimantan were always uh, very, very remote. Uh, so uh, th this discovery, uh, uh, really not, not just the Dutch learning about what they had in their colony, but I think the, the, there was a great fascination, different civilizations, different customs, uh, different languages, different jewelry. Um, that the Indies, although essentially one colony, could just have so much diversity within it. I, I think that was a, uh, a theme that comes through reading so many travel accounts. Uh, it was many, many people visited the Indies from Europe and the US in the 1900s, 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, 1890s. And this, this extraordinary amount of difference and diversity that they saw as they went from one island to another or one part of an island to another left a, a major impact on them. Now, a lot of these travelers were not anthropologists or not sociologists or, or ethnographers. That, that work tended to come um, uh, from different, different, different people because there were many at the time, um, or there were a few at the time. Um, uh, like in Bali and North Sumatra, for example. But, but I, I think this helps me understand why this Bineka Tundalika unity and diversity emerged as, as the national motto, because someone in 1945, be it Sukarno or someone else, looking around him, would have seen just this extraordinary uh, cross-section of, of different cultures, languages, clothing, jewelry, housing, habitat, customs, uh, as, they, as, they, as they looked around. And I'm, I'm talking aesthetically, but I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about personalities or um, other aspects, which obviously still uh, may people talk about today, like someone from North Sumatra might be different from someone from Bali or, or Central Java. But, but aesthetically, uh, visually, there were just so many differences as well. And, and it made me really have a better understanding of why there is this unity in diversity. Although as I traveled around 27 years in Indonesia, including the last five working for a truly national company, and I did travel very extensively visiting our branches when I was still with that company, you, know, you don't see the same diversity today, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not, I'm not making any statement here, but, but certainly difference in diversity uh, was, was what uh, stood out to me. Thank you, Scott. Uh, the next question is from Amanda Ahmadi. Oh, hi, Amanda. Hi, Pak Scott. Apa kabar? Baik, terima kasih. Ibu juga, bagaimana? Baik, terima kasih. We are in Melbourne at the same time, so you know. I know, permanent you know lockdown. <laughs> from the um, most livable city to the most locked down city. Yeah. Yes. Uh, but, but Scott, I have a question about uh, what is your thought of the, I guess this is also building on uh, Campbell's questions. It's this legacy of this exotic, um, I guess, uh, theme in, in that, that late colonial photography genre in comparison to um, you know, the other collection of commercial photographic studios such as Woodbury and Page and even Kleingrote. I mean, Kleingrote produced substantial collection on documenting the dramatic transformation of North Sumatra landscape through mm. the establishment of tobacco industry. Yes. And, and then in that particular look, a collection, you see that he's documenting kind of a displacement of a Sumatra Malay uh, community Mm. While he is also showcasing, for example, the Batak ethnic group, you know, so mm. this is, I guess, mm. two different stories, in fact, um, yes. that, um, but I guess, 
your reflection on the power of the postcard genre because in in sort of in in a sense it is a form of social spatial imagination to some extent mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and 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 how can we um i guess better position um the broader collection uh from woodbury and page you know it's really kind of neutral survey of the landscape some of their collection is about you know um documenting mm -hmm. how even the the ethnic groups are transforming themselves so it, it's it's not just about them being preserved but they are documenting a community in transition to some extent you know those mm -hmm. amazing mosques that feature kind of hybrid architectural elements mm -hmm. uh, that couldn't be defined as either you know traditional or modern uh, i guess i was just wondering what 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 your thought on these different framings mm. thank you amanda I think the way I would approach that is most of these photographers were, were, were commercial photographers. They, they had to earn a living and therefore they tended to photograph what they thought would sell. I mean, there were a few very artistic photographers like Tassilo Adam, who took some magnificent photographs in, 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 in central Java in the 1920s. But, but apart from him, if you look at Klein Grotter and Neuenhaus, they, they were commercial photographers. And so, as you pointed out, Amanda, Klein Grotter was, um, was often appointed by uh, plantation companies to, to do albums for uh, emerging plantations, obviously very successful plantations um, or industry that was emerging in North Sumatra. Um, I think Neuenhaus did some of that as well. Um, they, they had to photograph, I think, what they thought would sell and provide them with, with, with a living. And, and I would say the same thing about Woodbury and Page as well. Um, uh, the, the market may have been a little bit different. O often, would, there, there were far fewer tourists during the Woodbury and Page year. I mean, the, the glory days of Woodbury and Page were from 1857 up until, let's say, 1885. That, that was when commercial photography ruled amateurs almost didn't exist unless they were wealthy enough to buy their own camera. Kodak didn't start till 1888. And so uh, Woodbury and Page were often producing for people who had lived in the Indies for many years and were going to buy an album or a, a box of photographs and take it home. Um, and uh, many of these people obviously had a, a, who bought these albums or box sets or who were given them by their colleagues uh, we would have had a reasonably good familiarity with the Indies having spent five or 10 or 20 or 30 years there. Uh, postcards often fulfilled a, a, a different, I think, um, role to the extent that the recipients in many cases have never been to Indonesia and probably might never visit Indonesia. And so if, if there was more of a reflection and emphasis on the exotic in postcards, um, I suspect that's because some of the buyers of postcards might have wanted to show the exotic uh, to, um, to whoever was going to receive these postcards back in Europe or the US or wherever. But, but then again, as I mentioned before, they weren't only looking to show sunny beaches of beautiful women in postcards. I mean, the idea of receiving a, a postcard of, uh, of, of a gas works or a telephone exchange or um, or an electricity company would, 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 would be a bit bizarre, I think, in, in, in the modern era. So clearly, um, it wasn't just the exotic which was uh, receiving the attention, but also, I think, uh, I think a certain pride um, uh, in, in, in whether the cities that they were living, uh, post offices, I mean, government buildings, infrastructure, roads, bridges, all frequently appeared in postcards that were published uh, in the first couple of decades of the 20th century. And I think there was a certain pride in the progress that the colonies were making, which meant it wasn't purely the exotic that received the focus, but it was also, uh, I think, this element of uh, sharing with people that outside the Indies what, what was going on there, I think. Hey, thank you. Um, Kaitanya Sambrani is next. 
thank you, Marcus. Uh, thank you very much, Scott uh, Chaitanya yeah. here uh, from uh, Art and Design. Um, I'm very curious about um, the way in which these postcards operate within the trope of the colonial picturesque. Uh, this has been part of the discussion that's taken place so far a little bit, but in, to the extent uh, where they can become posters, in fact, not just postcards as they travel, they become kind of um, um, ways of making the beauty and uh, availability of the colonies so much more present and pleasurable uh, to the minds of those who are witnessing them from afar, uh, as it were. And in that, in, in, in doing that, they become a kind of justification of the colonial enterprise. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, they play a very important sort of propaganda yep. role. Yes, there's, there's quite possibly an element of that. I mean, postcards do tend to be positive images um, and um, they, they do tend to show people in, in very positive, dignified settings, for example, with their very nice clothes on or their, or, or their very nice jewelry, or, or for example, the men might be very masculine if they're with their, um, with their weapons or, uh, or such things. Um, but there, there, there are exceptions, um, uh, for example, like poverty, um, again, in the, the chapter on Java, which I didn't touch upon today, that there are four postcards showing children in poverty uh, in, in, uh, in, in central Java. And uh, these were published in 1919 as part of a large series that were um, clearly not trying to show um, sultans and uh, and uh, Bodoyo dancers, but we're showing uh, children dressed in rags and and um, obviously uh, even malnourished, if you look at the, the malnourished, uh, enlarged stomach. Um, there, there were postcards published after, uh, after, after independence showing poor children receiving the benefit of the Red Cross. Um, there were Batik images, not just showing Contented ladies with their with their chanting, making their beautiful batik. But there were some batik makers uh, who clearly look quite impoverished as well. Um, but but, but they're, they're very much in the minority. And I, I think yes, as to the point you make, yes, um, the the postcards can certainly send a, a positive image, a, a dignified image. But, but but they also, I think, portray the people. In a very dignified way. Um, I, I deliberately avoided postcards showing lots of Europeans surrounded by their their Indonesian servants. I, I, I totally avoided that because I, I thought that was to some extent degrading and had appeared in many other in many other books. I, I focused on images where I think the, the people were presented in generally a a dignified manner in which there, there seemed to be an element of pride in themselves or in their lives. Um, uh, whether that's naive, I don't know. But yes, yes, they, 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 they do have a, um, uh, a very positive uh, presentation, which, which is, is portrayed, and I would say probably 95% of the postcards. Yes. Uh, next question is from Aline Scott Maxwell. Aline. You there? Okay. Yes, I'm. I'm unmuted now. Yeah, uh, it was great to see see your collection there, or some of it. Uh, I just wanted to return to the to the diversity question. I may have misunderstood you, but I got the impression at the beginning of your talk, and also from the 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 shot of you, the introduction to your book. That what you that you yourself were indicating uh, that that there was greater diversity in Indonesia in that period, and you were illustrating that through your choice of photographs. So I, I'm just just wanting to clarify that because, of course, Indonesia is as ethnically diverse and culturally diverse today as it was back then. So I I, I suppose what is different is that the visual representation mm. of diversity uh, was uh, was stronger back then. So yeah, if mm -hmm. you could just talk mm. to that a little bit. Thanks. Yes, yes. 
No, that's very much my point. And I, I think I used the word visual or aesthetic several times because it is, it is uh, very much uh, a visual or aesthetic representation. For example, you, you can travel right throughout Indonesia now in most of the cities. Uh, you, you don't see traditional architecture really very much anymore. It tends to be a, a, a modern shop house or a collection of shop houses or, or a housing estate in Medan might be the same as in Makassar or in, or in Tangerang or, or in Bali now. Um, uh, Western dress uh, is uh, much more apparent or, or particularly for the ladies, probably Islamic dress is uh, uh, far more uh, apparent as one travels throughout Indonesia, the, the differences that one would see, for example, a, a Batak lady of a hundred years ago versus a Batak lady of a Balinese, of a, of a Balinese lady of a hundred years ago, uh, or a, uh, a lady in, in Eastern Indonesia a hundred years ago, clearly that, that that diversity visually in terms of clothes, attire, far more uh, apparent then uh, than one would see now, where it tends to either be Western clothing, jeans, uh, or, or, or Muslim attire that uh, is, is far more apparent than one would see now. So, but very much, I'm very much aware of the fact that, of course, now when you when you meet someone for the first time in Indonesia, almost the first thing you want to know is from where they're from. It's like uh, like Darimana, uh, in a way which you would not do in Australia. I mean, I wouldn't care if someone I met in Australia came from Queensland or from Perth or from. Um, but uh, but clearly in Indonesia, it's uh, it's still very important to know. Oh, this person's from. Uh, uh, from uh, Bangkulu or, or from uh, Medan or from um, Yanya or from, uh, or from Manado or from Ternate because this, this then automatically creates in us an expectation of what we can expect from that person by knowing something about which ethnic community they come from. So, um, so yes, while certainly acknowledging that um, great diversity still exists, and that's one of the attractions of Indonesia, you never get tired traveling around it. Uh, even after 32 years of living there, or 27 minus five. Um, but um, yes, yeah, certainly visually, uh, that diversity is, is far less now. You're only going to see these days wonderful Javanese attire or, uh, or Makassaris, or Bo Bogis attire or Minahasan attire or uh, Sumatran attire if you, uh, if you go to a wedding. Quite frankly, um, you know, it's a, one of the attractions of going to weddings in Indonesia. You, you do get to see that traditional attire, which uh, one sees in the postcards in this book. But now you often only see it in a in a wedding in a wedding setting mm. or a tourist setting. Thank you, Scott. Uh, one last question from me. So, what's next? Uh, so, you've um, produced four wonderful volumes. Uh, what's the next project we can look forward to? That's very kind, Marcus. Thank you. There are two projects. One is new and one is a revised one. I'm, I'm completely revising my first book, Batavia in 19th century photographs. So I did most of the research for that back in the, the 1990s when I was physically in Holland for several months and visited the various archives. Um, and um, in some cases, it was hard to get information on certain images or certain photographers. That was, that was the pre-internet era. And now we have um, uh, the internet. We have Delpha, of course, which is an amazing resource. Delpha is a, a game changer that you, you can access so much on Delpha that um, I, I'm re-researching -re all of the photographs in Batavia in 19th century photographs. My own collection of photographs from that era has expanded very considerably in the last 20 years. And um, I'm going to do a revised edition of, of that. Uh, I'm already working on that now. The other project, which is a new one, is I have some glass lantern slides from Bali. I have about 200 glass lantern slides of Bali from the 1930s. But the lantern slides were, of course, um, uh, used before the Kodachrome slide, the ubiquitous Kodachrome slide that I grew up with in, in the 1960s, 1970s, when uh, relatives would go on a holiday and come back with a, a pack of slides and show, show us the the plastic slides that Kodak launched in 1936, 1937. But before then, it was uh, the glass lantern slides were used to project an image onto a wall, and was it was a, a, an amazing form of um, again photographic representation. And I was able to acquire from the United States a collection of around 200 glass lantern slides, which 
the photographs were taken by a variety of photographers in Bali in the 1920s, 1930s. And this particular traveler uh, had them converted into glass lantern slides by a, a famous photographic house in Yokohama in Japan called Inami, Tianami, one of the most famous photographers and photographic ateliers in Japan. So um, I'd like to do something with that, but my knowledge of Bali is very limited. And I'll put in a thanks again to Richard Matthews and, and, and to Putri Matthews, because uh, Richard and Putri proofread the Bali chapter for this book they've been talking about today and have been helping with, me, my, with my knowledge of Bali. Adrian Vickers has been wonderfully helpful as always in terms of learning about Bali. And I hope when my, my knowledge level is, 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 is approaching adequacy at some point in the future, I will do something with this collection of glass lantern slides there. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, this would be the point where in a you know, normal uh, seminar room, we would hear a lot of applause. Uh, this obviously being Zoom, you won't hear it. <laughs> um, but uh, please feel the, the applause from, from the audience. Uh, big thank from us, from the Indonesianist community as well, for your work uh, over the last uh, two decades or so. The, your books are uh, really, really helpful resources for the historical research uh, on uh, Indonesia. Uh, to everyone else, uh, thank you very much for joining and please uh, log in to the next uh, Indonesia study group seminar, you will see announcements in that regard um, very soon. Thank you very much. Thank and you very much to you, Marcus, and to everyone who's joined today. And I appreciate the invitation to, to share and I appreciate the, the questions and the good discussion too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a good day. Thank you. I will Bye -bye. turn this off for everyone.